This explained everything is to look at the hormonal control of metabolism. First of all, recognize that metabolism has two components. There is the breakdown of molecules, which is catabolism, and the synthesis, which is anabolism. So the breakdown or the catabolic reactions are usually going to have the word lysis. Okay, so there is lysis, and that means to split or to break down whereas anabolic reactions are going to have genesis, so that is to synthesize or to make. Let's look at carbohydrate metabolism. So the catabolism aspect. We are going to have glycogenolysis, so we are breaking down glycogen to form glucose. Remembering that glycogen is the polymer of glucose, it is the storage form of glucose, so by proceeding with glycogenolysis, we are going to increase blood glucose. The opposing anabolic reaction is glycogenesis, where we're going to be taking glucose and storing it in the form of glycogen. So the anabolic reaction will now decrease blood glucose. Glycolysis is the breakdown of glucose, or one step in the full breakdown of glucose in the presence of oxygen, cellular respiration would occur, and you would be you know, getting into the Krebs cycle and um, oxidative phosphorylation. The key point here being is that you're going to be producing ATP and of course this can be an energy source for the cells. Gluconeogenesis is the synthesis of glucose from non-carbohydrates. Now this would include fatty acids, certain amino acids, the purpose of which is to increase blood glucose and that blood glucose can then be utilized to produce energy through glycolysis. Now looking at lipid metabolism, we have lipolysis. This is taking the triglycerides and breaking them down into fatty acids and glycerol. Note that these fatty acids can then be oxidized to produce ATP, so they can be used as an energy source, or as we previously mentioned, they could be used in the anabolic synthesis of glucose from the non-carbohydrates. So it can be used to produce glucose, which then again can act as an energy source. Lipogenesis is the synthesis of fatty acids from acetyl-CoA. Now if you remember that during the uh, cellular respiration, glucose gets converted into acetyl-CoA before it is entering the Krebs cycle. So acetyl-CoA could enter the Krebs cycle or it could be converted to a fatty acid. Okay, this is basically going to be a conversion that will decrease blood glucose, okay, but increasing fatty acids and then those fatty acids could then combine with glycerol and reform triglycerides. So this essentially could be a way of storing excess glucose in the form of fat. Looking at protein metabolism, there are no fancy words for the catabolism or anabolism of proteins, simply known as protein catabolism, which is going to be the breakdown of proteins into smaller peptides and amino acids. Protein synthesis, as you know as transcription and translation, is the synthesis of proteins from the amino acids. The protein catabolism could be supplying amino acids again for the synthesis of glucose, okay, gluconeogenesis. Generally, the anabolic reaction of producing proteins is going to be for growth. Looking at the hormones that are regulating metabolism, pretty well, all of them that we've looked at, human growth hormone, hormone cortisol, okay, T3, epinephrine, and glucagon are all acting to either increase blood glucose for utilization and or increasing the utilization of the blood glucose for energy. So you can see this is going to be glycogenolysis, which increases blood glucose by breaking down the glycogen. Cortisol similarly increases glycogenolysis. Cortisol is also going to increase gluco gluconeogenesis, increasing the levels of glucose for metabolism, and you can see here that it is also going to be triggering the breakdown of glucose for energy. T3 is also going to be stimulating glycolysis to increase energy supplies, and epinephrine is going to be providing the body with increased glucose for, in, uh, for utilization, 
And similarly, glucagon, remembering that glucagon is responding to a decrease in blood glucose, so it's going to increase blood glucose by breaking down glycogen and synthesizing glucose from non-carbohydrate sources. The only one on the list that is actually decreasing blood glucose is insulin, and remembering that it is responding to an increase of glucose or in the fed state, so therefore its role is to store excess glucose um, in the form of glycogen. Now let's look at the role of these hormones in protein and lipid metabolism. Let's start with insulin because we just finished talking about that. So insulin is responding to increased levels of blood glucose in the fed state. So as we previously saw, it would be um, storing glucose in the form of glycogen. It's also going to be promoting lipogenesis. Now, if you remember, that is the conversion of acetyl-CoA into fatty acids and then ultimately storing those fatty acids as um, triglycerides in adipose tissue. Um, so glucose, any excess glucose that hasn't been metabolized and has not been stored as glycogen can then be converted into fatty acids and stored for future use. Looking at all of the other hormones, their roles were to increase blood glucose for utilization or actually increase the utilization of blood glucose for energy. Okay, looking at this, we have protein catabolism, which is going to again provide amino acids for gluconeogenesis, which then the glucose can be used for energy. So we can see here that both cortisol and glucagon are doing that. And also we're going to have lipolysis, which is going to be providing fatty acids either for oxidation or as a source of non-carbohydrates for gluconeogenesis, and human growth hormone, cortisol, and T3 all do that. The other component here is with human growth hormone, it is going to be enhancing protein anabolism or protein synthesis for growth.